Welcome back to the Dauber Draftcast. On this episode, we'll be going over prospects who we think will make the roster or get a few extra games that can help Keeper League GMs staring at the waiver wire with, with late picks in deep leagues or investments for Keeper Leagues. Um, this is part three of our four-part series, and we have now moved to the East. Um, as always, I'm your host, Pat Quinn, Associate Editor and cover the Washington Capitals team at Dauber Prospects. I'm joined by... Ben Garrels, who is associate editor, covers the Florida Panthers at Dauber Prospects and writes for the journey at Dauber Hockey, sometimes pops in for ramblings. Um, remember to like and subscribe on YouTube, uh, and you can subscribe and listen on Spotify for podcasts, um, along with Spotify, Apple iTunes, and Google Podcasts. This totally isn't the same day that we recorded the Central, you can tell because we have different clothes on. Um <laughs> Yeah. Sneaky. Um, so we can just sort of get started. I should have, uh, bam, we can get started right away. Um, that's kind of, uh, Carolina. It's a pretty boring team. Honestly, the Metro is pretty boring in general too, because so many teams want to compete that there isn't a ton of room for prospects. Then, oh, I thought you were frozen for a second. Sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like, he's not moving. Um, so yeah, Carolina is pretty boring. Um, they're in the midst of the Stanley Cup window, uh, so there's a lot of spots that are already taken. Um, but since it's Carolina, and they're one of the smartest teams with money, they know not to overpay and can just get cheaper versions. When someone wants money too much, they just go, okay, get out of here, and they replace them with like a pretty awesome prospect. Um, up front, they added Michael Bunting, who I think will really help the team in real life, uh, not so much for fantasy as his time in uh, Toronto. Um, but he's also, well, he's going to help get the penalty kill out there too and carolina on the penalty kill is insane because you're like ah uh, are they the ones on the power play it's one of the most <laughs> impressive ones um also for some reason they signed brendan lemieux like i guess they really wanted to make tony d'angelo happy which I, I don't, know, I don't get that signing <laughs> well i don't know they, they're they already fine with bite lemieux such a dumb player anyway <laughs> i say this as he could crush me in hockey all the time but um yeah, uh, they have nine players making over one point eight million, um, and they also have Jarvis's ELC and Nason, who just seems to work on the number one power play and bottom six. Uh, and then yeah, they have Lemieux as the thirteenth forward. I think that makes the nine, ten, eleven. Uh, so you just one open spot, pretty much on them. They did add four PTOs for forward. Um, with that, I think Kiefer Bellows could be the most intriguing, but Nick Shore is probably the most lock if they want a depth forward. Um, so yeah, so then looking at it, um, Jack Drury makes a lot of sense. He's not really going to post many points, but he's someone the Carolina team likes. They had him up a bunch last year in a depth role. Um, no forwards really stand out for me, as they all seem to be sort of injury call-ups, uh, those being Ono Mariah, Suzuki, and Reese. Uh, what about you, Ben? What do you think up front for Carolina? I'm hoping to see Jamison Reese finally make the jump this year because he's another one of these guys that gets a uh, penalty minute and a half per per game, um, gets some hits, and he can score. So he was kind of having a, a tough transition to the AHL. He had a couple years in a row of like half a point per game or less. But this past year, he stepped up and was one of the leaders on Chicago Scored 42 points in 65 games with 92 penalty minutes, a couple of shots a game. So he's scheduled as a, you know, he's set as a center, but I wouldn't, obviously, sliding to the wing is pretty easy. So if he can, if he can stick in the middle six somehow, I think he could be an interesting person to roster because he wouldn't, he contributes across the board, which is always interesting. Um, also, I think, I don't know, this is just me, but I think Tony D'Angelo would make a lot of sense as a forward if you put him on wing and run the power play. I don't think it really works because it's tough to get players to do that, especially when they play defense forever, but it would stop him from just getting undressed in his own end all the time. So, But when well, last year he was in Carolina, he played awesomely with Jacob Slavin. So it's also Slavin's probably going to go low. He should go a little higher because him and D'Angelo just work. I have no idea why. Um, but on defense, this team's pretty stacked. I, they didn't really need D'Angelo, and they got him. And they have the depth pieces in Chatfield and Jones. And they got Pesci, Shea, Burns, Slavin, and signed Orlov. So their defense, uh, probably the best in the NHL. <laughs> so good luck cracking it, even though 
Uh, let's see. Shea, Pesci, D'Angelo, Jones, Chatfield are all UFAs. And in two years, Orlov, Slavin, and Burns are all UFAs. Burns may stay in the NHL. Who knows? He might retire. But Slavin, they're going to have to shell out big money to. Orlov probably goes somewhere else. They might not even shell out the money to Slavin. They might replace their entire decor in two years and still have the best decor in the league. And we'll be like, how did they do this? But yeah. Um, yeah. That's so with that, um, about their draft, do you, right? Yeah. Do you see anyone breaking in on defense for this team this year? Uh, not this year. No, I think uh, I'm pretty high on Alexander Nikishin and Scott Morrow in the system but like you say they'll they'll be a couple couple years especially nikishin um he's he's, he's looking just extremely dynamic all of a sudden yeah <laughs> yeah he let's see he played oh like for a while now since 2019 2020 was his first season there and he put up eight points over his first like 50 games and then he had 12 and 46 and he was like he just looked like a like a like a bangers guy, like good hits and blocks and penalty minutes and nothing else. And then all of a sudden he just completely <laughs> exploded last year. I think we all talked of a about him Nick on the top Lidstrom 50. with hits. <laughs> yeah. And we're just like, do we trust it? Or, you know, I think the consensus in the in the industry is yes, we trust it. And he's legit and he's coming over hopefully after next year. I don't know if you know what his contract is. I don't I have think it it's offhand. two more years. I think it's this year and next year is so the KHL. Years. Yeah. But, you know, he's 21, which is still young in terms of defensemen. And for him to be putting up those numbers in the KHL is just super impressive. So if he comes over yeah. as a 23-year-old who can run their top power play and be like a legit top pairing guy, I'm not going to complain about that at all. Yeah, also being 20 and being trusted or 21 and being trusted on defense, especially for a team like CSKA, uh, is very impressive. Yeah. As we all saw in people exploding over Vichkov, not getting in and thinking there's some conspiracy against him. And then he moves to another team and a coach will be like, yeah, we got no, we're not stacked at forward. You can go ahead and play. Play him. Yeah, it's it's pretty easy. Yeah. But yeah. Defense, I agree with you, Scott Morrow. I think he could get some games at the end of the year because uh, I think this is his maybe his last or his third NCAA year. So if he decides to turn pro, um, I think he'd get a couple games in. Um. Yeah, he's, like he's a lot like um, Ryan Ufko and Sean Barons in my mind, as in slightly below a point per game, age, uh, sorry, college defender who he's a little bit bigger than Ufko anyway. He's like 6'2, 200 pounds, and he's a really good skater. So he seems like the kind of guy that's going to transition to pro hockey no problem and uh, be able to ease in on their second power play and go from there. Yeah, but the but team's going be, for the cup. Be a couple years. So, yeah, team's going for yeah, the cup. There's not a lot of room tough. to get in there. I think they might let Tara Vinen walk uh, this year, and maybe they'll have another forward spot open. But then who knows who they'll plug in there? <laughs> they'll plug in someone and they'll work well. Like maybe Ryan Suzuki will sort of figure it out. He got hurt a bunch too, though. So he sort of dropped off the map. Or like you said, Reese could be the one called up and put in there and does well. I don't know if Carolina actually has an AHL team this year. Because Chicago went to be on their own, so that might be a big determinant for a lot of Carolina mm. prospects. They might be placed all over the AHL this year. I don't know if they signed a deal with a team yet. I think they might have, and I just have missed it. But yeah, if you know correctly, feel free to leave that in the comments. Um, in net, I think we all hope Kachetkov would be given the role, considering he's got two mil this year. But surprisingly, he is also eligible to pass through waivers. So he can go down to the AHL because they signed Anderson and Ranta. And it's kind of annoying because I wanted some Kochetkov in one of my pools. I was like, oh, yeah, I got him in this prospect draft, like this brand new one. I had the crap goaltending. My goalies, I basically got Anderson super late because he's a UFA, and now it looks awesome. But he also gets hurt. But, yeah, we know Ranta and Anderson both miss, like, uh, half the year. So Kochetkov should get in. He's got the contract for a bit. He's got... Getting yeah. paid more than Ranta, but yeah, there's no one else really behind them, is there? Nope, no one on my radar. So yeah, don't be too <laughs> disappointed if you have Kachetkov and you know he you see him starting in in, in the AHL because uh, yeah, he he's just like we've been preaching patience with Wallstead and Askarov and all these top tier guys. Kachetkov is right up there. He's uh, still fairly young, and for him to get some consistent AHL starts until one or both of Anderson and Ranta get injured. That's just fine. I mean, yeah. in terms of his, like the bigger picture, he's 24 though. So, you know, he is, 
ready to go. He posted 54% quality start percentage in his 24 games last year. So he, he does seem like they, they can turn to him even as a contending team and we'll be okay. Yeah. And they can probably easily call him up too. They're pretty smart with cap. Yeah. They know what to do, but now we move on to probably one of the most interesting teams up front. Um, with Columbus, uh, they're definitely fun, at least until Ma- Mike Babcock gets through with them. But as of this recording, he might not have been fired, and maybe he'll be fired by the time this recording's out. Who knows? <laughs> Up front, they have contracts for vets and a ton of young players. Um, I don't know, this team's pretty interesting, but also you're like, ah, oh, Mike Babcock plays this boring, everyone plays the same minute system. I hate it. Um, if he doesn't abuse the players. Um, <laughs> wait, allegedly. Um so uh yeah, so they have eight forwards making over one million, including Texier. Texier, who's returning? Texier. Um what? Yeah. Oh Just yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, he's returning. Um, so kind of leaving the battle. Um so yeah, they have eight forwards making over that and sort of leaving a battle to Marchenko, Johnson, and Fantilli. Um at Marchenko 20 goals. He's pretty much a lock. Ken Johnson didn't yeah. look out of place, he's a lock, Fantilli likely a lock um and that doesn't include sophomore slumped cole sillinger who can go on waivers and be sent down top russian import dmitry voronkov who's probably better for a middle role um ahl top scorer who never seems to get a chance on this team Trey fix Wolanski, um victor chinikov who is just completely overlooked <laughs> um then another overlooked player that columbus doesn't give a chance to is emil bemstrom and then, like you said earlier, Liam Foodie, who sort of just drops since being drafted. That's a great problem to have, but like an impossible problem. Well, great problem to have for the NHL team. Terrible problem to have for fantasy owners. <laughs> Who do you think sort of wins out for forwards here, Ben? Well, yeah, I'm uh, I'm hopeful in this team as a whole. Over the summer, I've been for the journey, I've been writing about um cognitive biases and logical fallacies in fantasy hockey versus like human judgment versus computer models. So I can, I can feel my optimism when I look at this team because I, I invested in Elvis Merzlikens in like 80% of my leagues before last year. And then he was one of the worst goalies in the, in the league and he signed yeah. <laughs> for like another four years. And he so, keeps getting hurt. Yeah, That's I mean, the biggest thing. Columbus has one of the, like top five, if not the best uh, prospect pools in the league. And a lot of them are close. And so they're, they are an interesting, exciting um, team for fantasy. I think you're right that Marchenko, Johnson, Fantilli are all going to make the team. Um, I, I think Ben Bemstrom is going to make the team as well. I just had a look at him um, this past week. He, uh, he was the most consistent scorer in the AHL by a wide margin. He only played like 24 games, but he scored in 90% of them. And the next yeah. <laughs> next uh, highest score was like 77% consistent. So, you know, he just, he's bounced around a little bit from Europe and through the pandemic, uh, the SHL and the Liga and the AHL. But I do think he makes the team this year and maybe gets 20 goals. Um, he's like a fast, uh, a fast goal scorer type. They've um, always had the shot, and but just like Columbus doesn't want to yeah. like invest in him in the NHL, it's the weirdest thing. Yeah, yeah, it sounds sounds like Chinnikov too. He's got his main thing is his shot. Yeah, Cole <laughs> Cylinder speed. is uh, Cylinder is on Twitter right now for kind of the wrong reasons. I guess he had a crush on a celebrity, and then they got together, and then it didn't work out, and then she made a song that seems like it's clearly about him. <laughs> so that's. That's how he popped up recently. Hopefully, he can focus himself on hockey again. He profiled very well in the hockey prospecting world. Um, he was one of the highest um, star potentials in his draft. But he's really hard to roster because he's not minors eligible in most leagues anymore. And he's just not rosterable in terms of what he's producing. So he also might now be behind Fentilli and Jenner. So, and maybe I don't Ross know. Slavic. Yeah. Roslovic. Sorry. Roslovic. Yeah. I think um, Trey Fix Wolanski is an interesting one. He was very prolific in the AHL last year 71 points in 61 games, lots of shots, like almost four shots per game. Yes. And he's one of these unicorns in that he's like five foot seven, uh, but like almost 200 pounds. So he's like, he's a solid, fast scoring type that 
doesn't really have too many comparables in the actual NHL. So, um, but he's a bit of a dark horse for sure. They don't, they don't give him a chance. It's, it's a great team to look at up front, but then you're like, just why do you have some of these guys get these guys off the team and get these young kids to just take over? We want excitement. <laughs> But yeah, I think Colson yeah, they, Winter also, I think they really should, like, I don't think he was rushed to start, but I think halfway through the year, they should have been like, okay, let's send him back. Like, whatever, we burn the years, it's fine. He seems a bit like a Ty Smith situation where he has quite a bit of NHL experience and quite a bit of upside, but just may have been rushed to the NHL, like you say, and I don't know. I'm I'm not too optimistic about him in fantasy right now. Yeah. He's definitely a buy low, but like you can't stash him anywhere. So it's like a draft yeah. low <laughs> or find draft on the low. waivers low. Like um, Ryan Johansson, I believe he was on like a whole bunch of waivers before he finally exploded in Columbus. So he's sort of that sort of thing. Yeah. Like if I was totally blowing up, like taking over a team and blowing it up, I would target someone like Sillinger. But yeah. if your team is at all established, you probably can't fit him. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's kind of hard to judge the forwards. They need to do something up front. And speaking of need to do something on defense, they have to make a move. <laughs> they brought in both Severson and Provorov. I don't know why they brought in both. Severson would have been fine. Um, Zach Wierenski, they have three more years of good Branson's awful contract. Andrew Peak, who looked great last year. Adam Boquist, who can't stay healthy, but is great for the power play. Jake Bean, who was out all year, who everyone forgets about. Um they all make over 2.3 million. <laughs> so that's one, two, three, four, five. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's about seven defensemen who all make over 2.3 million. They have to move someone. And then that that doesn't even like stand out player from last year and Nick Blankenberg, who looked awesome last year when no one else he was did. there. He did. He did. And <laughs> like um Tim like Burton when he was ball. called up. He seemed fine. Yeah, he was. And then they have David Yurchek just in the AHL, who's probably too good for the AHL right now. But like, you can't mm-hmm. roster 10 defensemen. I don't know what their plan was with this offseason. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, pretty nervous about the Columbus blue line. Like, if I have any of these players, I would consider moving them. And if any of them were traded, I think their value would probably go up. Like, yeah. presumably, Wierenski is going to step back into the top power play role. But any of these young guys could come in and steal it. Like if your check comes up, they might want him in that role. Boquist has, he's actually very talented. He's got a good shot. He's got good hockey sense. Um, If he could stay healthy, he'd be a threat. Jake Bean, like you say, could probably run the power play. So even Wierenski, who is probably the best bet on the team, I'd still be nervous about. Um, And then they have Denton Matejchuk and Stanislav Spozil. And they're probably yeah. still a couple years away, but they also look like they have very likely NHL futures. Yeah, I think Matejchuk is still going back to the. Uh, he's still in. He went back to junior. Sfozo is in the going to be in the AHL this year to start, and they also have Corson Coolmans, who people forget about, who was their first mm-hmm. round pick, who just came out of the NCAA, who could probably also run the power play. <laughs> I don't know, like, why would they? Hopefully, they get lots of power mess? plays. Yeah, I, I just I look at this team and I'm like, you have such an amazing defense, but you can't play them all. And like, you have to play Eric Goodbranson because you pay him so much. And Andrew Peaks flying in his own end to kill penalties. It's, it's this team is like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, hopefully Provorov can, you know, get back to his excellent shutdown ways. But I feel like he's not scoring or being a very good defenseman these days. So hopefully leaving Philly lights a spark under him and. He can, you know, he can totally let the power play go because there's so much competition for that and just focus on, you know, shutting down the other team's best players could be useful. Yeah. Yeah, like they, they could have one of the better defenses or just one that I, I don't even know. I don't know how to rank this team. They should be really good, but it's like you yeah. you want to have a lot of their players in fantasy, but at the same time you don't because it's like what chance are they going to yeah. get to play? <laughs> I feel like they're going to be better than last year. I feel like Mers Lickens is going to be better than last year. <laughs> yeah. Hopeful. And, uh, but they probably, if I just had to guess, I think they still will miss the playoffs and won't be that, that team. But maybe a couple years from now, I would say watch out. You know, there's, there's really a lot of dynamic talent on this team. Yeah. Well, the East is a meat grinder too. Like the Metro is pretty much stacked. There's one team that looks bad in the Metro and that's like it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah. I also have Columbus missing. Um, 
Mike Babcock, though, for all his faults, he's good for def- goalies um, in fantasy. So I think he could help Elvis bounce back. But oh, we don't good. know if Babcock's going to be there to start the year because of this whole investigation going on. They have Tarasov behind Elvis, who could easily steal the role now because Elvis can't stay healthy. Uh, who knows? He said he's going to focus this year a lot more on training. So I don't know if he just didn't last time or maybe he took the Chris Letang previous training of just do all weights instead of like yoga stuff. So hopefully he can just stay healthy because I do like Elvis a lot. And he is yeah. the better of him and Corpus Allo, But it's just like ever since he signed that contract, he's just gone like but Columbus hasn't helped. Yeah. I think he had a kid also, which, you know, as much as that feels a bit ridiculous to bring up, it like it's got to matter, right? I mean, no, that is a big thing. There was a thing yeah. I think Dauber profiled that like once if they have if it's their first kid, their production the first year is down or if they have like right? twins or something like that, it always goes down. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. See, I mean, seeing new parents, it's a it's a it's a lot. Right. So. Yeah, I think Tarasov is legit and could make a, a nice 1A, 1B situation with Elvis. Um, hopefully they just boost each other instead of having a, a negative dynamic. But Tarasov <laughs> is also one of the the better uh, goalie prospects in the game, and especially because he's close. He's a bit older and he's, his timeline is very short, which is not the case for a lot of the other goalie prospects we've been profiling. So they might split starts this year with a slight edge to Elvis, if I had to guess. And there's no one really behind those two either. Um, no one that stands out or is that notable. Yeah. So let's just move on to New Jersey. Even though, I don't know, you look at Columbus and it's a really interesting team. You want them to do well, but at the same time you're like, oh, the East is such a crazy team. And then we go to the Devils here, which are, hey, my team, they're stacked up forward. And yeah, that include um, Palat's terrible contract. Um, they don't even have room for Alex Holtz. <laughs> they have 11 players making over 1 million or more. I think four of those players are going to rotate on line four. Um, like uh, Nozick, well, maybe five actually, because they did sign Nozick too, but Nozick, Lazar, Bastain, McLeod. Oh no, that's four. Those guys are all going to rotate on line four. Um, so yeah, there is kind of a spot open. Three, six, I think. Kind of. Not really, but like if you're Holtz and you get in, you're going to play with like Halla and Palat, like good luck scoring. So I don't know. It's tough. I think they could put um, Foley on that line and maybe that'll help. I don't know. The team's going to be really fun to watch. Um, If you can get one of the players in the top six, that's good. Um, Yeah. And then with, uh, let's see, what did I write? 11 players making over one mil. Um, Four of those are on line four. And that did not include Dawson Mercer. So that's 12 forwards. Never mind. I miscount. My apologies, everyone listening. I know you're going to unsubscribe now. Don't. Um, and then for me, when I looked at it, like I, I said, Holtz, I don't know. It might be better just to have him in the AHL ripping it up until you have a guy in the top six hurt. Um, Tice Thompson and Nolan Foote have sort of been around forever. They could have a chance in sort of a bottom six role. Um, a dark horse favorite of mine is Graham Clark. Um, I profiled mm. him pretty well. He really broke out in the AHL. You and Victor both don't believe me because it was like his, I think, third year AHL he finally scored. But I don't know. I th- I think it could work, but there's just no room on the Devils and he might never get a chance to show it. Um, any forwards you see making this team or have a chance to? Yeah, I mean, Holtz, obviously, uh, I think they, they're going to have some motivation to try and make it work with him. He was such a high pick, um, but boy, that top six on New Jersey is so fearsome, right? Like Brat, Hughes, Toffoli, Meyer, Heischer, Mercer. That's not going anywhere. Um, like you say, it's pretty pretty established. Maybe there's a, uh, some room on the third line right side for Holtz, um, but it could even be that they give that to Graham Clark, who... Yeah. Took like three shots a three shots a game, was approaching a point per game last year in the AHL. And as much as we might be low on him uh, statistically in, in in the models, he still is only 22. Um, Brent Clark's brother is just always interesting when when you got that pedigree. So uh, yeah, I'd say Holtz or um, or Graham Clark. Another one who could be interesting is Chase Stillman. He's a bit more of a grinder type though. He, yeah. He, He's still coming out of the OHL and he's only 20. So given how hard this team is to crack, <laughs> probably he won't make it. And his OHL production and, uh, is nothing to shake a stick at either. 
yeah, Josh Philman probably has more moment, momentum than he does because he was up above a point per game in the WHL. But again, he's only 19 and this is such a deep team. I think <laughs> they're going to be contenders this year and uh, they're going to need people who can help them win now. Yeah, I also think uh, I see a lot of profiles putting Brat on the left side, but he's played a lot on the like he plays a majority of time on the right side. So I think that it's either going to be like the third line right wing spot is going to be open or maybe the second line left wing spot might be open. So there could be a huge chance for a prospect. If Holtz can play the left side, that would help him out quite a bit. So he might be a dark horse there. I'm rooting for sure if he's a left wing, right wing. I think he plays way more right wing, but I does think he does play left wing. So that could just be an under the radar thing. Everyone looking out there, follow the devil's guy. Listen to him. Um. <laughs> I mean, when, when you compare Holtz to Lucas Raymond, right? Like they were in lockstep coming up through the through the Swedish ranks. And now Holtz is still struggling to get established. And Raymond's like a top line talent. Yeah, Something's going wrong here. Well, Holtz kind of missed his uh, chance essentially to start. And Ruff was like, no, we got to get out this. So he always put Holtz on the bottom. He put him like two games in the top. He didn't look good. Bam. So just sometimes it also depends on the coach. Detroit had like no one else to put. And they're like, yeah, okay, Raymond, go ahead. <laughs> like, yeah, let's play. What are we going to do? Not play him? Ah, we need people to score. Um, So yeah, that's also a team dynamic thing too. Um, So yeah, let, let's look at defense. I think they're going to hurt a bit losing Severson and Graves um, along with Brunette as an associate coach. Like, Really, you guys couldn't mm. fire Lindy Ruff and put him in there. Um, but the Devils are going to just insert Luke Hughes, which, oh, oh no, poor them. <laughs> and give Kevin Ball more minutes, who also looked good. Um, unfortunately, this likely means Simon Nemec is in the AHL again this year. Because um, I can't remember the last time a team started two rookies on defense. You never know. Because Ruff, even though I don't like him as a coach, he does give chances to younger players. I don't think they'll want to roll with two younger players. Uh, so yeah, they did sign Smith. Will be the seven, six, seven. Colin Miller, who's not bad. But yeah, they're they're not going to be as good yeah. on defense, but they're still going to be good because they're still awesome. And they just, like I said, they put Luke Hughes in there. Like, there's no real defense other than Nemich who really stands out. Hey Ben, it's just sort of like you waiting for Nemich to come in. Yeah, I feel like we'll probably see some of Nemich, but uh, I don't know if he's going to stick. Just looking at um the numbers game here. Also, Seamus Casey is someone who's generating momentum. A little bit deeper in the system. He is an intriguing player in that they have tried him at forward at times in Michigan. Yes. So, but really the big story on the back end is Hughes and Nemich for sure. And it feels like Hughes is more likely to make it on the left side this year. And both of them will be waiting until Hamilton yeah. <laughs> departs at some point for their the real opportunity. And uh, But that also might be, uh, we saw in the playoffs of, bit i think uh they put hamilton and hughes together for the power play which then you take off one of the awesome forwards on the power play and he's usually brat and it was like uh, he's awesome on the power play so yeah mm -hmm. it's going to be both a good thing for the devils and a bad thing for fantasy because you don't know who's really going to be the main stays on the power play aside from hisher hughes and hamilton the three h's are pretty much going to be the mainstays but meyer can right. get stuck on the second power play i don't know uh, I remember they put Luke Hughes out there for a bunch against Carolina and he was getting run over on power play. And I was like, can you take him off? please?" like, this is Carolina's a different beast and he's a young guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a good point. Like people might be a little bit too high on Hughes. He's got the, he's got the Hughes name and he has a ton of momentum and excitement behind him, but he is coming into the NHL and we should probably temper expectations for at least for his year one production. But at the same time, he could also explode. I think he's going to be overdrafted, and but you don't want him to wait here. You sort of want to hit him in that nice middle spot. You don't want to take him too early yeah. and leave out the established guys just because he's the sexy new thing, you know? Um, if something happened to Hamilton, that would be really big for Hughes' year, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but Hamilton's just such a beast on the power play and then like when when he's healthy, but he does oh, yeah. get hurt, so yeah. But man, the shots all the time, it's like shots and hits. He's, he's like a Brent Burns. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then on defense, they got, uh, I think also another Daniel, my miss you. I don't know how to pronounce it. Sorry, Daniel, if you want to come on and pronounce your name properly or be upset at me, I'll send you a free dollar prospect fantasy guide. Um, yeah, he could have a chance down the line, sort of, he's 22 devils have sort of had him for a bit. Um, 
they might even call up Cal Foot. I don't really know why he's not very good. Um, <laughs> yeah, the end. Uh, so uh, that uh, in net, uh, it's Vanacek and Schmid. Um, I don't think the Devils need to go out and pay the exorbitant amount for Hellebuck. So stop asking. Everyone's like, oh, Hellebuck right now, just trade whoever you want. It's like, uh, I mean, he'll be good, but don't re-sign him for the contract he's going to want. Um, Dawes is out for a bit. They signed Kincaid and Calgren, who are depth. Like, I think the Devils might still try to grab someone on waivers for goalies, because I think there might be a few extra goalies on waivers. Um, but there's no real goalies that are going to uh, jump out on this roster, aside from the ones we know with Schmid, who did look good in the playoffs. And then everyone sort of forgets when he looked really bad in the playoffs, just because Vanacek looked awful in the playoffs, but Vanacek was awesome during the season. Vanacek's always been an up-and-down goalie. Believe me, I'm right for the Caps. I know this. <laughs> but he's still a good goalie. Um, and then Nico Dawes, I think they're waiting on longer term, but he's only going to start again this year, I think, in December, January. So he's going to be even longer of a wait. Any goalies? Okay. Stand out? Ben. Yeah, no, uh, Nico Dawes was the only one I was going to mention because he was, at one point, he was the head of Schmid in the system and then Schmid leapfrogged him. So Dawes is still around and he's probably going to see a lot of time in the AHL, I guess, whenever he gets there. Um, but I don't think Schmid or Vanacek is just going to take this net and run with it. I think it's going to be a split situation and they'll maybe, they'll either ride the hot hand or what I think is the prudent approach would be to alternate starts and keep them fresh. Yeah, I think, I think Schmid is, um, a legitimate talent and I think he has showed enough that he is an NHL starting potential goaltender. Yeah, they're, they're also Devils have the ability to be able to outscore teams if they have bad goaltending for a game. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So now we will, we just profiled uh, uh, basically a stack Stanley Cup contender, two um, interesting, fun teams to watch. And now we move on to the most boring team that is just seems to want to be maybe playoffs, maybe a wild card team, the New York Islanders. Um, <laughs> there's no room at yeah. forward for anyone. We resigned everyone to like a long term deal. <laughs> the, this average at best roster has 11 forwards making over 1 million somehow, including Ross Johnson, who rotates on line four at times. And we guys still signed forever. That was one of the most bizarre signings. Um, this leaves <laughs> a battle at the wing spot on line three. Um, probably going to Hudson fashion because he did look well at the end of the year. I was, I was happy someone gave him a chance because he's sort of been like the, um, Cesarnak, who's like he's always been good in the AHL, never really gotten an mm. NHL chance. And then you see he's like, hey, this guy can actually play. So I was happy he got a chance. Um, but yeah, he's probably getting the left side with Pajot, and the other side is gonna be um hopefully Oliver Wallstrom. And then we don't know if Oliver Wallstrom will get any power play time, even though he should with his shot. Um, which means Julian Goche, Simon Holmstrom, William Dufour, and Ruslan. Ice Kakov and Otto Koivula are all going to have to battle for any NHL ice time, which is a really a boring mess, eh? Yep. Yep. That's uh, unfortunately described the Islanders for a long time, which is, <laughs> it's, it's been weird that they have Matthew Barzell because he seems like such a, more like a Zegris type. Like it, it seems like he should not be on this team. Whereas Bo Horvat makes a lot of sense, you know, Anders Lee. But uh, yeah, I think Brock Nelson, Ruslan, 60 points. We don't know yeah, how. Exactly. <laughs> Ruslan Iskakov is one that jumps out to me in their system just because he's not a very well-known name. He's a little bit older and quite a small player, which a lot of people tend to discount. But um, he had a, a really good year in Germany after playing in college for a little bit. And then he was one of the top scorers for them in Bridgeport. And he's just, he's a very dynamic player. He's a little bit like, more in the Barzell end of things than the Islanders end of things. I don't know if that counts against him in the, you know, for his likelihood of making the team, but it would be, if there's someone who's going to come up and be dynamic, it's probably likely to be him because Simon Holmstrom, I'm, I'm over it on Holmstrom. He just, uh, he got an opportunity last year and just went scoreless for so many games in a row. Uh, even though he's finally looking good in Bridgeport. I was so excited. I was like, all right. And then he goes, and then they the Islanders are like, ah. work, but yeah, it's like you can play two no, way. You'll just... show up sometimes. And Wallstrom still feels like a prospect a little bit because he just hasn't really gotten established. And I don't know what there is there. I think I'm really concerned about his injuries. He he strikes me as a bit of an Anthony Mantha type, 
who has like all, like so much potential, really good shot, plays a physical game, everything I look for, and could be a top line sniper type. And I just I'm starting to have my doubts about him. And then yeah, the, the only UFAs they really have this year are Clutterbuck and Martin, who they'll probably resign for four more years for some reason. <laughs> And Carson Kuhlman, who's got a two-way deal like this. <laughs> you look at the four cards, like UFA, UFA, UFA. And it's like, man, how? Yeah, but they'll, they'll challenge for a playoff spot because it's a solid team up and down. Goaltending yeah, I mean, on this team is insane, and the defense is good. Yep, they're um, they're a team team, you know? Yeah. And uh, actually, the other guy I wanted to mention was William Dufour. Dufour. Yeah. Uh, he was also one of the top scorers down in Bridgeport, and he had going back to that Bader comment about transitioning to the AHL as a high scoring junior player, that really does matter that year. And he went from 116 points in 66 games with the Sea Dogs in the Quebec league to 48 points in 69 games. So his trajectory is right on track and he has a history of serious goal scoring. Like he got 56 goals in 66 games his last year in junior. So that's a valuable player and he could, he could find a home on this team. Let's say yeah. Wallstrom's injured and they're looking for that sort of goal scoring power forward type spark. Yeah. On line Easy three for imagine. 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, I like, I like actually both the guys you said, uh, Ice Kikov and Dufour. I we're probably saying his name horribly. Like apologies. Let's call him Ruslan. Ruslan just came into the AHL his first year and Bridgeport is not known for really being a good AHL team. And he no. was just like, he's a small guy who just like stood out. And Dufour, like his, he's a bigger player, and his QMJHL production sort of went like this, which is always a bit concerning. But then he stepped right in the AHL and was like, boom! He didn't struggle to start. He just, bam. Yep. And his, he's a big guy. His skating seems to have, like caught up to his size and looks great. But the only issue is like, when is he ever going to get a chance on this team, unless they trade someone? And like, he's got maybe in two years they'll move Kyle Palmieri and he'll get a second line spot with. Uh, JG Paju, like, woo. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Watch out. And on defense, this team is also like the exact same thing. They have five D men making over 2.5 more or 2.5 million. Aho likely takes up the number six spot. Like, we all love Noah Dobson. Um, we expect him to still be the power play quarterback. Um, Romanoff, he's fine, good for hits and everything. Um, but yeah, so it really sort of they signed all this and it sort of makes it tough for Bull Duke and Salo. They have to battle for the six, seven spot, but they also seem like awesome young players and they don't have a chance to make the team really. Uh, but they both do require waivers to be sent down. So the Islanders might be, might be stuck keeping them and maybe just move Aho down. I don't really know what their plan is. But yeah, any defense really stand out for you? Um, Bull Duke is someone who's been on my radar. Uh, he took a, a big step up last year um, in his third, I guess, his third AHL season. So he was never a big scorer in junior, which is never a great thing to see for NHL equivalencies. But, you know, he took took two and a half shots last year and upped his scoring and was, I think, the, the top scorer on Bridgeport on the back end, um, which is good to see, I think. Maybe Salo is a bit more of a power play type, though, which could be interesting. But uh, given given the makeup of this team, like they have such a solid sacrifice your body type defense core, um, I think Bull Duke will will fit in especially well to that that mindset. You know, with Mayfield, Pollock, Pellick, Romanov, that's just a matter of uh, space for him. So if you really need some peripheral help in a in a deep league maybe consider Bull Duke, especially because he still has his minors eligibility. But uh, not much to see here and not much on its way either. Yeah, Lou did the same thing to this team he did with the Devils before leaving. Just signed everyone, old players long term. Just hope to make the playoffs. Um, but then in net, like, I don't know, I was always hoping that Jacob Skarek would eventually get a shot, but that's not going to happen now. Is I Varlamov off for one, two, three, four more years. Which isn't bad, but now they're going to have Sorokin and Varlamov for four years, which isn't, like I said, the worst, even though Varlamov is just going to keep getting older and hurt more. But it doesn't matter when they're like, ah, oh, whatever, we got this Sorokin guy. I guess he can play. <laughs> yeah, Varlamov is the backup is just fine. Yeah, and Sorokin is one of the best goalies to own in fantasy, even though he doesn't win. Yeah. Like, 
you have any peripheral stats in fantasy, you want him. And yeah, but there's no one coming up. It's just, yep. <laughs> Let's it is what it is. Team. <laughs> um, moving on to the Rangers. Uh, team that is a uh, yeah really up against the cap. Um, signed some cheap free agents this year. They've pretty much filled out the roster on right wing with Real- Wheeler. Um, and the bottom six with Benino, Vesey, Pitlick, Nash, and Lishijin. Um, we need we all want um Lafreniere to make the jump. Same with Kako. Um, everyone's still panicking on them. Lafreniere has never really been given a top six shot because since he's been there, Kreider and Panarin haven't been hurt. Um, and it's sort of hard to leapfrog established guys. Um, I think this could be a bigger year for Kako, hopefully, because he really doesn't do anything for referrals and he's really hard to roster because he doesn't want that jump. I think this year will be a lot better. But again, he's, I think, in the Dauber model or the Matt Straker model with uh, 400 players for these big guys, like it takes a while for them to come through and I think Kako is on that list. And I think Lafreniere is on that list too. Yeah, they're going to be coming up. Any options at forward that could surprise for this team for you, Ben? Yeah, Kako is like right at the upper limit of the break breakout threshold, like six foot two, two oh six. So he passed his breakout threshold forty games ago, and we didn't really see the expected twenty five percent boost. So it might be that he is a bigger player, which in which case we're waiting, what, like another two or some. three seasons, <laughs> which I don't think people want to, people, I don't think people want to hear that. But uh, yeah, I mean, patience, patience is a lot more necessary and extended in fantasy than, than we would prefer, especially if you draft someone and you have to sit on them for like six years. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's so, so long in fantasy. Especially when they but, take uh, up I a roster mentioned... spot. Oh, yeah. I think we mentioned in the top 50 chat that we we both still believe in Lafreniere and uh, we're trying to, like, he's cheaper than he once was, obviously, when he went first overall in fantasy. So it's probably easier to get a hold of him. And if you play multi-cat formats, he's actually surprisingly valuable because he hits a ton, which uh, it reminds me of someone like Jake Gensel, where it's actually not a good sign if he's hitting a lot because it means he doesn't have the puck. As soon as Gensel started putting up point per game numbers, his hits dropped to, I think he's even below a hit per game now when that was kind of one of his calling cards coming up. But uh, the right side is a lot more open in in New York than the left side. So if Kako is a right winger and they are okay with finally splitting up this kid line, which I'm not convinced they will, it could mean Kako gets some some top line time. But... uh, I don't know. Other people here are Brennan Offman, who is probably done with Junior, and uh, I can't remember if he's come up to the AHL yet, but he's yeah, he is. He's probably one of their actually, top backs. Yeah, I was going to say something, so I can add to what you're going to say. Um, I read that he's been training a lot this year, trying to because uh, he usually played left wing. I'll throw Junior, but he's been training this whole off season on right wing in hopes that that makes mm. him make the team. So I think he could be an underrated player that way because where they have issue is on the right side. Like their left side is stacked. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Offman is someone that I, I actually don't own anywhere, anywhere, but uh, I'd be really interested in for fantasy because he he hits, he shoots, he scraps, um, and he scores. He might be a little bit of a Josh Waugh type, Roy type in Montreal and that he's not quite a top-line talent. But... Uh, It'll be hard to say until he actually arrives, but he, especially if he can get into the top six, anything could happen. It could be a bit like a Matthew Nye's situation in uh, Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Um, another option at forward I like for, is Will Cull, C U Y L L E. Um, I think he's more a bottom six sort of. Well, get some hits and multicast stuff that way. I don't think he's gonna take this team by storm. He'll be a solid sort of checking guy. Yeah, that's all I really had a yeah. forward for them. Like they're pretty full of forward. Good goal scorer. And they filled up their um, depth, yeah. Adam Sikora is on his way and he's uh he's like a really great bottom six guy. Like <laughs> yeah. probably not awesome for fantasy, but he's really I think he's gonna be super useful in, in real life. Because uh and hits he's just like too though for cheap hits. Full... Cheap hits and caps yeah. leagues. 
he's such a classic energy player and he's like he's such a pain to play against good two-way presence i don't know what his, his timeline is but um i wouldn't bother rostering him for fantasy unless you need help in those specific categories yeah 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 but he's also he's back in europe i don't know when he comes over but yeah probably a year or two i would guess um mm. but yeah uh, on defense the team's likely full as well um Metro is pretty boring, honestly, for prospects. Like I said, um, top four is locked in um, with Fox, Truba, Miller, and Lindgren. Um, they did sign Gustafson, which is kind of an odd signing, but I guess they want someone to also pass the puck a bit. He's pretty known for that. Um, but then interesting note that I found here is um, like Schneider, they had him up most of the year, right? But he is still eligible to be put on waivers. So he can be sent to the AHL and Zach Jones, who I think everyone likes in fantasy a bit, but it's tough for him to get a shot. Um, he requires waivers to be sent down, so I think that could be sort of a flip. Mm. But Schneider is sort of better in his own end, but he's more highly touted for them. And Zach Jones is better at scoring, so I don't know what's going to happen there. But that was sort of an interesting thing that popped out for me. Um, they also signed Connor Mackey's depth, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah, I think, Ben um... Harper still they have a guy that is uh yeah ben harper they might put him at the six to be the tough guy yeah schneider um does have great peripherals which is valuable in certain formats but uh if you look at the player usage chart for him and zach jones it is ugly (laughs) Uh, (laughs) you have all the top guys including lafreniere and kako um driving play all the guys you'd expect and then Zach Jones and Braden Schneider were both sheltered and they both um, produced abysmal results in terms of play driving. So they, I know they're young guys that it, I'm pretty sure New York sees as building blocks, but um, they've got some work to do. And unless we start to see that those play driving numbers change this year, I would, I would be wary of them in, in fantasy. Yeah, I know Schneider does hit a bit more, so that might be more favorable for Laviolette and his uh, system because he's the mm-hmm. new coach here. He's a pretty boring coach. <laughs> he loves the neutral zone trap. Um, there's no one else really on defense, eh? No. Yeah. No. Uh, and then in net, it's just Durkin's team. Um, they're going to have to pay him a boatload of money soon. They have Quick as the backup, which is interesting. I guess he's, yeah, he's the only place to really sign him. He signed for pretty cheap. Um Injury pro no, and they don't have anyone who's going to challenge Shesterkin for a while. They signed Louis Dominique for depth. Um, I think a lot of people like Garant and Olaf Lindbaum. They're sort of dark horses, but they don't like no one's taking the net from Shesterkin, so <laughs> he's locked in there yeah. for ten years. You you just hope that what they become a backup, like a decent backup. I don't know. Dylan like Garant had a, a really solid um. AHL or sorry WHL career for Kamloops um and so far he's had a rocky transition to the AHL numbers were nothing special but like you say I mean what what is the best case scenario for Garand probably playing 25 games and with good ratios which is not something to hold your breath for (laughs) yeah it's like oh sweet I guess I have him uh, I guess he works in leagues that have prospect game limits for goalies that you can sneak in, move up and down your bench. That's mm-hmm. might be about it. Yeah. And then we move on to Philly, who's um they're interesting for sure. They have a bunch of good rookies, but then you also have a no idea who's gonna be in the doghouse under torch. Like it's a tough, tough thing to get. And oh, they're also hell. getting Couturier and Atkinson returning. So now they have eleven players making over one point four million. Uh, meaning there's a battle for the 12th and 13th forward spot um, between Tyson Forrester, who really looks good to end the year. And apparently he's uh, all Philly brass is really impressed with him right now, starting training camp and everything. Um, Wade Allison, who honestly injuries really ruin this guy. Like he looks so good. And then it was like injury, 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 injury. Um, they have Tanner Laksinski, who just seems like a depth guy. Ole Lixell, who did play really well in the AHL. And then he came up at Tort seemed to like him. And then they also have Bobby Brink, who's awesome. It's going to be tough to sort of make this team unless they make some trades. But like, there's there's a lot to like on this team. But also, it's tough to like a lot of the forwards on this team because Torts is really boring for his system. He doesn't like risks. 
doesn't like players playing fancy. You know, you get benched if you do the Michigan. <laughs> but yeah, um, who are your favorites for this team at forward, Ben? Yeah, they, they feel a bit like uh, Buffalo or Columbus in terms of I think they're going to be a really exciting team in a couple of years to own players on, but it's going to be tough in the meantime. So they they have some interesting players for sure coming up. Like by the time Mishkov arrives in what three years, uh, I think that's going to be the time that you're going to want to own the core pieces here in Philly. So Forrester, like you mentioned, he kind of went from being a no name. I got him really pretty late in the draft um, a year or two ago, and now his value is quite high in fantasy. People want to get a hold of him. Um, Cutter Goche is another type, a little bit like Offman, who he's got that multi cap potential and he has top six all over him. Um, so he's someone, if, if I, I don't own him anywhere, but I would love to. Uh, Bobby Brink, we were, people were quite split on him at the, in the top 50 exercise. I think he's, he's such a, a small guy who has been knocked historically for his slow skating. Um, that the reputation on him is a little bit mixed. Also, he went from his transition from being like winning the college scoring title to the AHL was could have been smoother. And kind of like I was saying before, he's not a huge shooter, so he's more of like a playmaking type. But the, um, the last year, though, he did he was coming back from the hip injury, so there was that too. Yeah, yeah. Plus, sure. he wasn't profiled but, uh, like, actually at all in the top fifty because he played ten games. Ah. Oh yeah, but the year before, uh, I think well, you're talking about that one. He was up and down. Maybe that's the year what it before. was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually a huge Brink fan still. I think uh, watching him in his his ten games for Philly a couple years ago, he impressed me. He didn't look slow. He was you know he was moving just as fast as he needed to. He could sustain a breakaway, if not like pull away speed. I think he has at least average speed, and that might be all he needs. He's really a really smart player. He's got a two way presence. I remember watching him for the Americans against uh, Canada at the World Juniors, and he was such a pain. He was constantly stripping <laughs> the puck from players and, and causing problems, and he was like one of their third liners. Um, so, yeah, he could come up and um, be an interesting player for this team as soon as this year. Yeah. So unfortunately, um, like I said, with Couturier and Atkinson coming back, that does take away power play, even though Philly's never been good on the power play. It's sort of bizarre with the players they have. But I guess I'm yeah, bring trust someone that, that could help that. Uh, I yeah. think the U of Denver had a pretty good power play, and um, we'll talk about Mike Benning when, when we get to Florida, but they he's got good power play instincts. Uh, another, just the last sort of depth guy I wanted to mention was Elliot Desnoyers. Um, he... I think he has like middle six written on him or that's been his reputation coming up. Uh, He was drafted back in 2020 in the fifth round. So he doesn't really have that pedigree, but I'm quite impressed when I look at his, uh, his numbers to date. So he had, you know, his draft year performance was not great, but then he upped it right away in the queue. And then he upped it again in his, in his draft plus two. And then his transition to the HL was very smooth. um, And he was one of the, top scores for Lehigh Valley. So he only got four games last year, and I expect as long as the numbers game works out that he can claw his way onto this team somewhere, and he might even yeah. be a Torts favorite. So yeah. you just never know. Philly's tough this year because they're they're really stacked at forward, and they have some prospects, like you said, with Columbus. Like, they're just trying to, like, let us in. And it's like, well, sorry, we got these contracts in the way. Zade Wisdom was also someone who looked really good when he popped in the AHL for a bit and then went back and didn't mm-hmm. look that great. I think he had an injury again, but he might be a long-term one. Um, I think a guy who's going to slide a lot uh, in hockey pools this year is Owen Tippett, and he's going to be one to for sure own. But again, you don't know if he's going to play third line or top line. So it's like it's tough to grab a Philly player because you know they'll be bad for plus minus, but you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I love Tippett because he shoots and hits. And yeah. has like a floor of fifty points and maybe a ceiling of seventy. So he's yeah, a no, he's, he's a pretty high player to target this year. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's about yeah it for forwards. Then if we go to defense, um, they tried to move Sandheim all off season, which didn't work. Um, also don't mind it. Sandheim's not the worst. Um, but the defense of this team stinks. <laughs> Five players make over one million with Sealer. 
Uh, oh yeah, they signed Mark Stahl for some reason. I don't really understand that. Um, Sealer they signed, uh, and Zamula are battling probably for the last spot. Um, Zamula requires waivers to be sent down, and I don't see them wanting to lose him. Cam York uh, should be running the one power play. Um, he's probably a big sleeper, but something that's going to go against him is that he can be sent down on waivers. And if the Flyers are like, well, we got these six to start because of cap reasons, he could be sent down and maybe they'll let Ristolainen, I don't know, <laughs> run the power play. Or Zamula. But yeah, so I like York and Zamula a bunch. Um, I hope they get more time. Um, some oh yeah anyone you like ben just uh the analytics crowd was so brutal about the wrist alignment signing <laughs> that's what that's one of the worst signings in recent memory for me uh yeah. so that doesn't make any sense that they locked him down um yeah cam york seems like the one to own here he seems like he's uh free to take the, the reins to the top power play and he wasn't overly sheltered last year either. He was kind of like mid pack and didn't get that many offensive opportunities, like because he was behind D'Angelo. So, with D'Angelo gone, if he can get that extra offensive deployment, it wouldn't be surprising to see York hit 40 points with some decent, maybe 15 power play points this year. Um, and with hopefully room for growth. He also has pedigree coming out of the, the US development program. And, and I think he was part of that really stacked class, wasn't he? With, uh, with Hughes and Degris and Caulfield and Boldy. I think so, yeah. Yeah, um, so the defensemen were kind of lost that year in the hype for the forwards, but he really, he's he's coming up the right way as like a smart two-way presence. Um, I also have a soft spot for Emil Andrea, and he's a bit more of an unknown commodity coming out of um, Sweden, but he is profiling well at every level. And he's a smaller guy, but he's been Sweden's captain at a number of tournaments. And he's a feisty player with good instincts. So I, w- I wouldn't worry about his size. Um, he gets penalty minutes. He knows how to get shot through the point. Um, I don't know if the numbers game will mean that he's on the outside looking in this year, but he's starting to knock on the door at the very least. So I think his stocks are headed up. I like him a bunch too. I just worry about him in a trot system, right? His trots can be like he's too small to play defense. I don't trust him. Right. But if Yeah, he... and that's where someone like oh, go ahead. I was gonna say if he smashes through all the battle drills, then he'll be a torch favorite. Yeah. As long as he doesn't fall I, over. <laughs> I wouldn't bet against him. No. Um someone like Ronnie Adderd, uh yeah. he could maybe be more of the fit that we're talking about, like a six three, two hundred plus pound guy. Um, some history of scoring dating back to the NCAA days. And he was about a half game, half point per game in his first year with the AHL. I think maybe he's had some injury concerns, but he seems like a, a kind of like a rugged guy who could get decent peripherals in the right circumstances. Again, it might not be this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if he is in their top four, putting up decent numbers in a couple of years. Yeah, I know the Flyers like him. I think they re-signed him this year to a two-year deal, and the second year is one way, so they hope he can make it by then. Um, Oh, and one player also uh, in the trade with L.A. They got Heel Grands from L.A. Um, He's not going to be someone to score, but he's going to be sort of an awesome two-way type defense fit. Uh, He's probably still a year or two out, but I think last year he played in the AHL, and he was fine in the Kings system. So the King have a plethora of defensemen, and... He was moved to Philly, so hopefully he can help them. Yeah, he's got size and smooth skating, but uh, is negligible value for fantasy. He just doesn't <laughs> put up points. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe blocks. Really, really counts blocks because he doesn't seem like a big hitter yeah. either. Um, nope. Yeah, all right. Now we get into the, the mess in Philly. Like, well, there's kind of a mess at forward, but you know who'll be there. But, like, the big mess is this team seems to have about five goalies that could play. Um, they took Peterson to try and rehabilitate him. They could also throw him on waivers because no one's claiming him. They have Connor Hart, even though they were reportedly trying to move him all year. Um, Felix Sandstrom, who did look good last year, but it requires waivers to be sent down. And he's on a one-way deal, but with many teams capped out, um, he might not get claimed. No one really knows what's going on with Ivan Fedotov in regards to the NHL. Like, Philly doesn't seem to care that much that he's playing 
and CSK, even though the IHF does, I'm like, oh, do they not care about this contract they signed? No yep. one knows. And the then the Flyers also gave a big raise to Samuel Erson in 2024-25. Uh, he's going to make 1.45 mil next year for the next two years. So it's like, did they think he's their goalie of the future? Like, this is just such a confusing mess, Ben. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think Peterson and Sandstrom are just stop gaps. And Urson, I think, has starting potential. I think he has to show more. But um, that contract suggests to me that they at least would like to see him in uh, their backup role, if not this year, then moving forward. And he's he's produced decent results um, in his role so far. I think as a Carter Hart owner in one league, I'm pretty nervous about his value just completely tanking especially because all the news about the uh, the 2018 World Junior Sexual Assault, um, which is rightly being followed up on. And he just went dark a couple of weeks ago in his social media. And uh, oh, I think that that one, that one was a different account. They're, they're all not dark. Oh, was it? Yeah, someone oh, I think okay. made a, a fibby thing on Twitter. Okay. But it is still well, yeah, I mean, because of that time. Like Alex Formington think... has just vanished. I hope they I hope they actually do look into this and take it seriously and punish those involved. Um, fantasy doesn't matter one bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, so hopefully I think he's it, not it one of them. And hopefully he told the truth. So that could be good, too. Yeah. I think it's been a little ridiculous just watching it unfold that we're taking at face value players putting out these statements saying they had nothing involved. And like everyone put out these statements except what Formington and was it just Formington? I don't but remember the, 100%, um, so. Yeah, no, but the, the woman's initial statement mentioned, like, a bunch of guys. So yes. I think there's there's some mess here, and Hart might be involved. So if we're able to put that aside, I think Hart is uh, still could be a very valuable fantasy asset. He's, he's young. I think he's a bit post-hype. Um, you know, he came in younger than almost any goalie in history and did quite well for that. And then because the team sucks, he's had a couple down years. Um, but I, I still believe in him longer term as a fantasy asset, as long as he wasn't involved in this scandal. Um, so, but I think he might still be tough to own for the next couple of years as Philly works things out. So you might get some good volume from him because he doesn't have, that solid of a backup behind him unless Peterson is rejuvenated. But um yeah. Plus we'll we don't even Hart. know if Philly believes in him. Like that that's the reason why you don't want to rush like a wolf or a wallstat or something to the NHL. Um, yeah. when they go through these down, because there's always a down as good as these goalies are, once you're 21 to 24 range, there's always a down. And it's much better to battle the down in the AHL than the NHL. Cause in the NHL, if you're down, you stay down and they go, okay, you're out. So it's much better to keep these guys. I think Hart was rushed for sure. The first year he looked awesome. And then after that, like you said, like Philly also thought they were good, even though everyone's like, oh, your team sucks. And then it was like, Phew. and yeah, it just mm -hmm. battles on the confidence of the goalies. Um, a goalie long term, too, is uh, Alexei Kolosov. Um, he's been getting quite high yes. praise. Um, I think he's coming over next year um, to play at least in the AHL. So people need to watch and invest in him. But because just because Philly's pretty wide open, like is Urson for sure guaranteed? Or do they think Kolosov is for sure guaranteed? So, so love yeah, Kolosov looks it great. Come over, like, or will they just leave it? Be like, ah, oh, it's fine. Just stay in the cage. Oh, whatever. Like no one knows. I think Kolosov's only like twenty one. So even if he came over, I wouldn't. Uh, don't expect his timeline to be short. But he does. He does look like he's on a star trajectory right now. Yeah, and also what's annoying about this 2018 scandal is that we just keep hearing, oh, shortly. It's been shortly for like a year. Like, can you guys just release mm -hmm. the damn thing? <laughs> yeah. Apparently everyone knows too. You see people be like Elliot, I think, said, or someone said, um, it was like, oh yeah, they know. They're just waiting. It's like, what are they waiting for? <laughs> can we figure this out? Oh, anyway, yeah. so from that, we get to a frustration kind of for fantasy owners and if they own any prospects in Pittsburgh. Um. The team added players all over the season, uh, especially in the back end with the big fish Carlson. Um, Dubas came in and sort of revamped the forward core uh, in the bottom six so they can actually defend instead of thinking Jeff Carter can do that. Um, this team's just pretty much overly full up forward. There's no real room for prospects. 
thankfully Alex Nylander made an impression enough to get a contract last season. Um, a lot of people liked him, and then he just went to the a- AHL and was like down, little blips, nothing really. Then when he came to the NHL, he looked pretty good. Um, even though he wasn't scoring a ton, I still like, thought he looked pretty good in the top six role. But he was also besides Gino, who played eighty two games. Um, yeah, and we always know that the Penguins have injury issues, so they'll put people in. And because Mike Sullivan's an awesome coach, they just seem to win without injuries. Last year, I guess, doesn't really count, but we can blame that more on Hextall than Sullivan, or maybe we can blame Sullivan because he kept putting people in. But anyway, so they have about 14 NHL forwards, 10 of them making over $1 million. Um, yeah. Uh, anyone you think can make an impression at forward, Ben? Yeah, I think uh, I'm over it on Samuel Poulin. I don't know. He, he, he was their top prospect for a number of years, but I just uh, don't see him being impactful scoring forward at this point. Nylander, because of his pedigree, you never know. He put up 50 points in 55 games last year in the AHL, so he finally showed the scoring spark. I think he was like a sixth overall pick or something like in 2016, so he's he's way post-hype. He's pretty um, high. But he has, yeah, he has interesting pedigree. Um, I think the one I'd, I'd put my money on is Valtteri Pustin in. Uh, who's kind of came out of nowhere. He's a small guy again, but uh, he came up just for one game last year and they put him on the power play. Uh, so you never know. 59 points in 72 games last year. Oh. So, um, yeah, I think if anyone's going to come up and make a scoring impact, I think it's pushing him. No, I, I like him actually quite a bit too. The only thing is they, I don't know, they don't seem to want to really give him much of a chance, which is kind of weird. Um, he's only got one year left, for, but he's arbitration eligible for an RFA, so he might be able to force him to give him a one way deal next year. I don't know. I like I like how he looked. He's a smaller guy, likes to pass more. Um, one thing on Poulin though, um, he is just twenty two, so there is still quite a bit of time, and I think it's a mm-hmm. lot of fantasy owners getting impatient because they're all like, "Well, you should be the top line right wing now," <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, not much other than I could let people know a fun little tidbit note for myself. I hate drafting Brian Russ and I just completely leave him alone in any fantasy leagues. So if you're in a fantasy Thanks. league with me and you uh, really want Brian Russ and I'm there, don't worry, he's yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, on defense, this team has seven D men signed, uh, and really just NHL depth. So no prospects are really ready as it's like. Pierre Oliver Joseph and Ty Smith sort of battling for the same spot. And then Pittsburgh went and got Carlson and Latang and be like, hey, your any chance of getting that spot is out the window now. Um, and then they got Ryan Graves, who's good. He should help uh back there. That's a big upgrade over Doomlin. Um, yeah, none of their prospects are really ready on defense, though. Hey Ben, like they have some nice ones, but they're all years away. Yeah, I mean, I'm really still looking at Ty Smith. Um, I don't know if it's going to make sense for him now, especially with Carlson in the picture when it was only Latang, who's an injury risk and PO Joseph, I figured he could out battle Joseph because, uh, Smith is a pretty dynamic player who's could really explode on a power play, especially with uh, the talent the Penguins have. But, um, I'm feeling less optimistic for sure. Now that Carlson's in the picture, if everyone's healthy and Joseph doesn't get traded, I don't know. But um, yeah, he seems he at least has the upside and the and the the background performance up to this point that he's someone to keep an eye on. He's tricky though because he can't stash him because he played in New Jersey so much. <laughs> so he's one of these guys that is just kind of like a tweener. And yeah, what does he have? 123 games. So if he played a full year, he'd be on track to hit his breakout threshold, which would be interesting statistically. Um, and I, I do think he has more to offer. Like when he when he was called up for nine games, he put up four points and like a bunch of shots and a bunch of hits, and they gave him seventy percent of the available power play time. So they do they clearly are trying to figure out what they have in him, but maybe they also clearly decided to go elsewhere with Carlson. So well, that's also like that was pre Dubis Dubis too, hey? Eh? Like they had Ty Smith is like, okay, let's figure out what to do since true. we traded him for John Marino and look awful in that deal. And then Dubis went and yeah, got I, Eric Carlson, and now it's like, well, where are you, where are you going to put Ty Smith? Man, the guy's bread and butter was he looked really good for scoring. Yep, 
I kind of hope they, they move him and uh, just because I own him in a couple spots. And if they move him somewhere <laughs> like San Jose, you know, yeah, that's San Jose with their mess but... of defense we looked at last time. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's, you'd want to see him move. Um, he could be the th- like third pairing puck moving guy. So they might also do that. Who really knows? <laughs> All I know is they still want to compete for Sid and Gino, and I'm fine with that. I yeah. like the competing stuff. That makes sense. Yeah. That's what they should in do. Net, I think. Yeah. In net, uh, they just hope Jari can stay, uh, well, can stop getting hurt for half the year. Um, at least they did sign a better backup in Adelkovic, but he also, the bar the Smith left was a really low bar. So, like, good backup is pretty good backup. Uh, <laughs> there's no one really to challenge for a bit. Uh, they signed Helberg for depth um, long term. I really like Joel Blomquist, but he's still a few years out. There's there's no real challenger for Jari for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Nijelkovic, um was a great AHL goalie, and he seemed like he was going to be the Hurricanes goalie of the future and just has flamed out and really struggled in Detroit. Um but maybe he'll settle. Maybe he's more of a backup guy. So Helberg also seems decent, but he's he's already 32. So he's just one of these like giants, <laughs> six foot six, 220 pounds. Um, and he's been passed around from a bunch of teams now, Nashville, the Rangers, Detroit, Ottawa. So he's probably just depth at this point. I don't know if he's an NHL player. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty much Jari's team. They just really hope he stops getting hurt. Yeah. And he really just keeps getting hurt. So <laughs> they kind of shoot themselves in the foot with this, but they didn't really have another goalie to go out and get. You just hope he can stay healthy because he's not bad. Uh, he always right. seems to go a lot lower in fantasy than he should. But when he misses half the year, then it's like, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't have drafted him then. But yeah. But in your mm-hmm. in your Ty Smith thing, I think he's a really good late round pick if you're in a really deep league and you can maybe just see where they put him. Otherwise, like he's pretty yeah. much undraftable. Kind of like Cole Stillinger, hey? If you're, yeah. if you're blowing up a team and you're trying to target like upside guys, Ty Smith is still a good bet. Yeah, and and you send uh, emails to Dubas all the time, and be like, "Can you just trade him, please, please?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's get into another old team that is trying to still try to um, help their stars win one more cup in Washington. Um, uh, do yeah. I started this actually. I wrote this. Hooray! The Capitals have finally allowed some young players to get a little a legit chance for an NHL spot. Like I'm so happy watching this. <laughs> I had to watch Laviolette be like, no, no, no. We we want no. this fourth line guy. We'll we'll put this guy who isn't good in here, or we'll we'll bring the, we'll bring McMichael up. He can have seven minutes and be scratched for four games. If he doesn't produce, then pfft. oh god. But yeah, um, it makes the roster very intriguing. Um. Now I say that, but the team has eleven forwards signed over one million. Um, but Pacioretty isn't going to be ready for a bit. Oshi gets hurt all the time. He's not reliable. Um, team is still trying to move Mantha and Kuznetsov, but with the cap this year, I don't. I doubt that'll happen. So there's a battle for I think at least two spots on the roster. And since I write for the team, I know quite a bit. Ben, I'll let you uh, look first and go over it before I sort of go into my whole spiel that I wrote. Okay. Um, yeah, coming up in the system, I think Mirosh Mirosh Nichenko um, is an interesting power forward type who could be like a goal scorer who hits like sort of like an Ovechkin light at his at his peak, which would be awesome for the Caps if he could step in before the Ovechkin era is over um, and kind of grow into that role. They're taking a swing on Matthew Phillips from the Flames, which is kind of interesting. Um, he's 25 now and he has been dynamic at the AHL level. I think he has like 200 points in his last 200 AHL games, but, uh, he had a bit of a rough transition to the AHL in his first year and he's a small, he's a smaller guy. So if the coach doesn't like that way that he plays, then (laughs) probably is going to miss the NHL altogether. So he's one of those like boom bust types and he's trending more to the bust direction now that he's 25. Um, I thought they drafted really well because they got Ryan Leonard and Andrew Cristal. Leonard is like a can't miss top six guy, and Cristal is another boom bust, like very very high skill type. So um, that was an interesting swing. And then uh, this was on the top fifty. I asked you about Ethan Frank 
so I don't I don't know a whole lot about him. But in terms of if you're looking for a a late round swing, he's a 25 year old guy who just um, was a high scorer in college and transitioned extremely well to the AHL, where he put up 30 goals in only 57 games, taking over three shots a game. So he seems like someone who could come up and find a find a home on Dylan Strom's wing, for example, and and put up some numbers. Um, and the last guy that is close, possibly, is Hendricks Lapierre. But um, I've I've declined an in interest on him in fantasy, just again because he's one of these playmakers who isn't going to shoot a bunch. But if you need some power play assists um, in a couple of years, he could be the next sort of Backstrom light. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, what do you got? Also with with uh, the Bears, they were the Calder Cup winning team, and that um, always helps young players in development when they go through that. I think even Torch said it's like that's he always huge for development of young players when they go to when they go through the Calder Cup if they can actually win it. Um, yeah, I like a lot. I agree with a lot with what he said. For me, the clear favorite to make the team is still McMichael. Um, it's because he's been there forever, yeah. up and down. He does everything they want. I think he'll get a legit chance and. Hopefully he's put into a spot like, hey, you got Milano and Strom. Why not make Michael there on the right side? He can play uh, any wing. He can play center. So he's good. Um, the team favorite is Alexi Protas, who just sort of jumped out of nowhere, like third round. And he just sort of continues to play well. Um, even the AHL he scored. Um, he was put on the top line, I think, two seasons ago, even with Laviolette taking over the team um, with Ovechkin and Kuznetsov. Um, he's not going to be a big scorer, at least for a long time. So his scoring is going to be slow to come, but the team really yeah. likes him. Um, Joe Snively is really underrated. Um, sort of the same type as Ethan Frank. Uh, they signed him after a good NCAA career. Um, when he came up in the NHL, he did good, and then he immediately broke his wrist. So that like, bam. <laughs> but he was great for the Bears on their run. Um, Phillips, I agree with. Um, uh, but I think he really should have picked a different team. Uh, I think the Caps were a bad team. Like, yeah. I know Mitch Love came to the Caps, and that's why he's like, oh, okay, well, this guy knows how I play. Maybe he'll help me. But um, I just think, like, he's got to make the team, and he has to do it, like, ahead of draftees. And the Caps love their own draftees. So McMichael and Protas probably have the inside track. Um, I th- honestly think he should have stayed in Calgary. But, like, when he left, he left because Sutter was still the coach. So he knows he wasn't going to get a chance. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't play like a small player either. That's one thing that oh. jumps out to him about me. Like he's he's fearless. He's scrappy. He like um, hangs on to possession quite well, and he scores. And he's a consistent scorer. So there is a lot to like with Phillips. Yeah, um, Ethan Frank, like you said, he's good. Um, like high scoring. He also was the fastest AHL um, skater in the All Star game. I brought that up before. Uh, Beck Malenstein, he's just the bottom line guy. So hits deep league. Um, Hendrix Lapierre, I, I like him. I, I think a lot of people have pretty much forgotten about him and sort of put him to the wayside. Um, a lot of his scoring in Hershey doesn't look great, but that's because the Bears always keep their team low scoring and even scoring. And they don't, you know, like even put out there, they don't trust the rookies right away. They don't give them the guaranteed time. I think he's a big buy low, but I also think he stayed in the AHL for another year. Um, Perrick Dubé is someone they signed. Um, He had an AHL contract with uh, the Laval Rocket last year. Um, He looked pretty good. He may get a couple cups of coffee, um, but I think he's more to get an impression later. He's a good late stash. He's only 22, so um, he got an AHL contract. His numbers have always been good. I don't really know why no one took a look at him. Um, but yeah, he could be a good long-term gen. gem. Uh, Mirosh Nashenko, I really like. I put him way too high in the guide. 12 was a little too high, <laughs> but I still quite like him. I think he's really underrated. Um, him and Ryan Leonard could make the... Oh, yeah. Uh, him and Ryan Leonard could be awesome. Ryan Leonard could also make the team at the end of the NCAA this year. Like, who knows? Maybe he'll just be like, yeah, I'll go pro. Whatever. He's big enough. He could probably do it. Um, yeah, so that's all I really had. Like I said, I wanted to get out that whole list. <laughs> I wasn't going to go too in-depth. But uh, on defense, yeah, the Capitals have... Yeah, thanks. I, I write for them. I feel like I should do a little extra. I expect that for Florida. Um... <laughs> no problem. Just FYI. But it's easy because you're like, ah, oh, no one. Um, <laughs> on defense, yeah. the Caps... <laughs> Caps really don't have a lot of room on defense. Um they decided to block Lucas Johansson from making the team uh, by getting Joel Edmondson uh, as Alexiev sort of 
leapfrogged him. But they were both around the same time. Um, yeah, there's there's no one really special. I, I do like Lucas Johansson. I think a team will pick him up on waivers, at least hope so, or maybe they'll trade him once they got Sandine too. Sandine's awesome, young player. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, yeah, the Sandine Vincent, pickup was excellent for them. He he looks like of, like a fifty point guy. Yeah. Yeah, he just needs the power play time, but they have John Carlson too, yeah. so it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. No, Sandine looks really good. That was a great trade. Um, I was just gonna say Vincent Iorio is like a good long term prospect. Um not one to spend an early pick on, but I think he's gonna be a solid sort of middle middle of the lineup guy. He's really like impressed since they drafted him in the second round. He just all of a sudden came to the HL and was one of their better defensemen. Um yeah, any defense that really jump out for you, Ben, or he's sort of like, nah, there's no one really here. Uh, not really. Yeah, I think Alexiev is hopefully going to stick. I know he's had a pretty long injury history at this point. Um, and he probably doesn't have a whole lot of offense, but he could be good for hits and blocks. And uh, Iorio is the only, the other one in the system who also doesn't look like a high end guy in terms of stashing him, but he's probably the best they have. Not much to see. They did sign Chase Prisky too. Remember him? Mm, Carolina Florida for a bit. wasn't he in Florida? Florida? I swear he was yeah. in Florida. Maybe before you wrote oh, yeah. for them. They also signed this oh, yeah. Hardy Hammond Atkill guy. Um, he put up big numbers in Europe. He was drafted and then not qualified and then scored in Europe. But then, like, I don't know why he would have signed with the Capitals because you look at this team's depth for defensemen. Uh, go ahead with uh, Washington defense. I ended saying something on Washington D, but it's okay. Go ahead. No, I, I think. Uh... Alexiev, I hope will finally stick, and uh, maybe we'll hate, we'll stay healthy. Um, but beyond, like you said, Vincent Yorio, who I don't know a ton about, to be honest, uh, I don't, I don't see a lot here. Their system was uh, completely depleted, pretty much, <laughs> um, before they put Crystal and Leonard into the system. And they also have uh, just going back to forwards for one sec. They have uh, Alexander Suzdelev. Yeah. who was uh, kind of notable for playing with Bedard this past year. Um, and Cameron Allen was supposedly going to be one of the top uh, defenders in the 2023 class, but he seems like he had a collapse of confidence or something. But it seems like maybe he will be could round into a bottom four type who does a yeah, bit of everything. Sad, sad note on him, though, is he's going to miss this whole year because of oh, shoulder surgery. Year. Yeah, oh boy. or most yeah. of the year. Yeah, it's like, oh, terrible for development after that, and you want to have a big rebound. It's like, damn, poor kid. Do you have uh do you have any thoughts on Ryan Chesley? He seems like a smooth skating, good pedigree, came out of the development program, not a lot of offense, but a yeah. solid defender. He's just gonna be one of the solid ones that the uh, caps normally draft on defense, like mm-hmm. Ferrari, who's just like doesn't score yeah. a ton, but yeah, he'll yeah. play two way and he'll be good. Yeah, was, exactly. Caps are great at drafting for how much they don't draft high. Very similar to Pittsburgh, huh? Yeah, well, Pittsburgh just doesn't have any picks ever <laughs> and just signs guys. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, so in net, um, it's Kemper and Lindgren until they get hurt. Um, I think the dark horse this year is uh, Hunter Shepard. He's 27, so he's pretty old. He played in the NCAA oh, yeah. forever. But he was the AHL MVP in the playoffs when they went to the Calder Cup. So I think he could get the first call up. Um, otherwise, long term, I think the team really likes Clay Stevenson. And Caps are just kind of a goal tending factory. Like there's even a chance Mitchell Gibson could become a goalie or Garen Bjorklund, who missed all of last year in the ECHL with back surgery, but he could come back. So yeah, Caps are just always this sort of a, a goalie factory. They're a really underrated one. Um, any goals come back. pop out for you? <laughs> uh, no, just Stevenson is the only one I was going to mention. Um, I think we had him dubbed as a star potential starting goalie in the prospect report, which always is usually the first time that a goalie gets on my radar if I haven't heard of them. Uh, Kolasov was another one with that designation. So um, it seems like he did quite well in the ECHL this year, which is actually a bit surprising to see a goalie do well in the ECHL. It's a bit like of a wild West type of scoring, less structured league. So if you put up good results there, that bodes well for his future, but he's probably still a little ways away, even though he's 24. Because the caps don't need to put anyone in there with Kemper 
Uh, I see yeah. at least two years away. They, the Caps with goalies, though, they always they have a goalie. They stick them in the ECHL right away. Oh, yeah, okay. Two AHL ones, yeah, they've always done that. Vanacek did it. Um, Neuwirth did it. Varlamov did it every time. Oh, I, guess Neuvirth. Just, I think Samsonov wasn't the one who did it, but that's because he was in the KHL for the other time. Right. So, but yeah, they always just stick the goalie that they like in the ECHL for the first year. And, yeah, because they had oh. Zach Fucali last year, and he seemed like he was going to take a big rebound last year. He sort of crapped the bed, and Hunter yeah. Shepard took over. So, yeah. But yeah, that's really about it with the Capitals. Anyone... You want to pop out or no? We're good. No, that that's it. Yep. All right. Well, that's all for this week then. Um, follow okay. us on Twitter. Mine is at FHP Quinn. Ben, yours is B Gear B E E G A R E. Uh, yeah, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, if anyone wants to pay the show for some sponsorship, email is always open. You know, I I always say that, and I keep forgetting to write down the email. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> same with the Twitter DMs. So that's probably your best bet. Um. At Dauber Draftcast or mine at FHP Quinn. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, bye everybody.